Hello. So first of all, um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this year's Qubit conference uh, for giving me a chance to speak here and present to you um, our, the work of our group. Um, since I am a first time speaker, maybe it's best if I just say a little bit about myself. So my name is uh, Jarka Vodip and uh, I am a PhD student at the Jozef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, Slovenia. And what I want to talk to you about today is um, actually simulating actual physics on D-Wave's quantum computer. Um, more specifically, I want to simulate quantum configurational tunneling. I'll get to that later. Um, and it turns out actually that the quantum computer doesn't work as we want it to yet. So that's why we employed a machine learning approach to try and well, fix it. Um, okay, so let's first take a look at why we even want to do this. So our main idea is to use a quantum computer to basically solve a problem which a classical computer cannot. So here I just um, I just want to show you two examples of research studies that have been done quite recently, very su successful ones, as you can see. Um, and well, what's going on there is that um, physics that is already known is being researched with a quantum computer. Um, and then what's happening is that they also compare um, the performance of a quantum computer with a classical solver. Um, but the whole point is that there, are, there isn't really any new physics being done here. And with our idea, we really want to push beyond that to discover something which has not been discovered yet with a classical computer. So as it turns out, um, we actually sort of stumbled um, on an experiment um, that we then theoretically also modeled. Um, and we, it turns out that it suits perfectly to D-Wave's quantum computing model, which is great. Um, but sadly, the problem is still really hard to solve. And this is actually why we decided to employ this machine learning approach, um, which will help us to actually solve the problem. So first, I want to tell you a bit about what this experiment is actually about. So the material we're, we are dealing with is a real world material. It's called the 1T tantalum disulfide. Um, its structure is shown here on the right. And these uh, blue spheres um, are tantalum atoms, and the yellow spheres are sulfur atoms. Um, and as you can see, um, this is a layered material. And turns out what you can do is you can make an assumption and you can basically get rid of all the other layers except one and treat it as if um, it, it's independent of all the others. It's, it's a good assumption and it really simplifies the, the treatment of this material. Um, and this is what's done here. Um, so this is just one layer and uh, we even stripped um, out all the sulfur atoms. We just took a look at the tantalum ones. These are these uh, orange spheres now. And it turns out that there are some um, leftover electrons present still in the system which are not bound tightly to the uh, tantalum atoms. And these are this is represented by these um, blue spheres here. Of course, as you know, electrons are charged particles, so they uh, repel each other via, uh, we assumed, a screened Coulomb potential. This is shown by this wiggly green line here. Um, and so there's also one other thing. These electrons, you, you can vary their number in the system. This is sort of a more technical detail, but everything is written. All of the things I've said about this model is written here in this Hamiltonian or energy form of the system. This is just keep this in mind for later. So um, then what we decided to do is to explore this model. We did it mainly with Monte Carlo simulations. 
Um, and it turns out that because these electrons repel each other, they want to form lattices. So basically you get an electronic lattice on top of an atomic one. And they are both triangular lattices. So these here are just four examples of um, electronic lattices which can form. And it, funnily enough, um, what you can do is you can actually go into the real world and find a bunch of materials. Uh, so this is shown here in this column. There's a whole bunch of real world materials um, where our model is applicable and you can find these electronic lattices in them, right? So this is what, what I also want to show here. So um, these are just three examples, this ABC, of actual um, like measured electronic lattices. So what people do is they take an STM microscope. This is STM stands for scanning tunneling microscopy. Um, and you, you, you can basically image this frozen electronic lattice in, an, in a real world material. Um, and then what's even more interesting is what happens when you, for example, take one of these lattices um, and then you put in or take out a few electrons, right? So for example, here um, you, you can shine, so here you can shine a laser on this state and then you effectively you put in more electrons than were there before. So what you get is, again, you get these um, electronic lattices like this one, for example, but they are separated by these domain walls in between. And this is important for our experiment, right? So the reason why I had to explain all of these more technical uh, details to you is because now I can finally get to our experiment, right? So our experiment is, um, it goes as follows. So this here is an image of one of these domain states, we call it, right? Because the, uh, there are these domains here present in the form of electronic lattices separated by domain walls, right? Um, and then we asked ourselves the question, what happens if you, for example, take one image and then it takes about, let's say 20 minutes or half an hour to get one of these images. And then you take another image and another image. So basically you get a sequence of images in time. And what's interesting is this happens. So the state relaxes back into, uh, not entirely, but it is relaxing back into a uniform lattice state. So let's take a look at this backwards in time, I guess. Um, I hope that you can see that actually these domains are moving, right? They're also being created. So a, a lot of these electrons move around, right? I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and well, this is fascinating to see, but immediately when one sees this, we ask ourselves the question, um, what's going on? Why are these electrons moving? So what we did is um, we actually plotted the rate of electron motion. So this is on the y-axis versus temperature. Um, and then we started thinking about it, right? So one possible explanation of why these electrons move is because of thermal fluctuations. So because there's temperature present in the systems, these electrons can hop from one atomic side to the other. That's nothing really special, nothing new. Um, and for example, in this um, sort of large, like higher temperature range, this is a completely plausible explanation because there is this temperature dependence of the rate of motion, right? But then something interesting happens when you move down in when you go down in temperature. If this was indeed thermal hopping, um, you would expect for this um, rate to saturate to go to zero to go to zero. But instead, it saturates at a finite value. And the only other explanation for why these electrons move is actually quantum tunneling, right? So temperature is out of the question now, the electrons can just tunnel now by quantum means. So here, the sequence I've shown you 
This is actually taken at four Kelvin. So you can actually see sort of in, I guess, real time, as you could say, um, electrons tunneling from one configuration to another, right? Um, so we said, great, this is a wonderful experiment. But now the question is, can you actually simulate this on P-Wave, for example? Um, for that, we try to flash, flash out a plan. And um, what you, what we, the steps you would need to take um, is, first of all, you would have to implement our theoretical model or deploy it on D-Wave and also embed it, of course. Um, and then secondly, you would have to somehow introduce electron motion on, on, on D-Wave. Um, and then thirdly, you would have to introduce temperature in your system, right? Um, so we wrote down this plan. Um, and of course, the final, the fourth step is um, to actually measure, to, to plot this plot and compare it with the experimental one and see if it fits, right? Um, so let's go through all of these steps. Let's see if you can actually do this. So step number one, we have to define the model. Um, there's a whole bunch of, I guess, technical difficulties in this slide, but um, the point I'm trying to make here is you have this Hamiltonian I've shown you before. This is our model. The question is, can you map it onto this um, Hamiltonian, which is usually associated with D-Wave, right? Um, this Ising form. And it turns out you have to meet in the middle. You have to um, go to this Cubo um, form of the, of the Hamiltonian. And you can actually sort of package our um, interaction into this uh, Q matrix. Um, and now these individual logical qubits um, represent basically whether a, so if you have QI here, then um, this QI represents whether an electron is present. So if QI is one on a lattice site or if the electron is not present. So if QI is zero on this site, right? Um, and this can be done um, with a bit of math, but it's doable. Then the next question is, can you embed it, right? Can you actually put our sort of interaction or graph on the D-Wave Chimera graph? So here I wanted to show you a four by four um, system. So these, the, imagine these are like four by four tantalum atoms. Um, can you map this or rather, what kind of graph would you need to connect um, to, to simulate this sort of a system. Turns out that you need a complete graph. Turns out that every qubit with our type of interaction needs to interact with every other qubit. Um, and as you can see, the graph is already pretty complex. And what I wanted to also show you is um, you can actually do that on D-Wave. So um, this is uh, this uh, image in the middle, this is, how, or this one on the right, this is uh, just with all the actual couplings present in D-Wave. Um, you can actually do it on the Chimera graph. You just need to form these chains of uh, physical qubits to represent one logical one. Okay. So um, it turns out that if you actually want to go to where classical computers cannot, you have to go to bigger system sizes. So for example, seven by seven. So this is 49 logical qubits. And as you can see, the uh, complete graph in this case is quite complex. There's a lot of connections. Um, and you can also see that on the actual 2000Q um, chimera graph, it, the complete graph takes a lot of space, right? So maybe you could go one system size larger, so eight by eight, but that would be it, that's the limit. But that's okay, it's fine, because you're already beyond what classical computers can do. All right, so that's step number one. Now let's go on to step number two. So how do you sort of implement electron motion in, 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 your, um, in your simulation? So, the idea we had is to use reverse annealing. So reverse annealing is um, 
I mean, if you are familiar with the um, normal annealing procedure, this is very easy to understand. So basically you start off with this final Hamiltonian um, and this A here, um, which basically introduces tunneling in your um, system is at first zero and then you turn it on, not all the way, just a little bit and then or by let's say half, and then you turn it back off. Um, so how does this introduce electron motion? Well, the idea is that from our Monte Carlo simulations, we've um, sort of found out already that these um, domain states, um, if you change around the configuration, they are still pretty close in energy actually, which means that for example, if you would start off by putting an initial configuration onto D wave um, and then turn on the tunneling just a little bit, then you would immediately get this uh, side that I wrote out. You would get a superposition um, of these uh, dif different configurational states, which are still close in energy. And then when you turn the tunneling back off, what you would get is that D wave would, D -wave would choose another configuration um, and you would get tunneling, right? It would tunnel into a different configuration. And then you, would, you could do it again and again. And what you would get is essentially the sequence in time I was showing you before, right? Okay. Um, now the third step, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, you can introduce temperature um, on, in, in D-Wave. I mean, the physical temperature on D-Wave is fixed um, uh, at all times. It's just that um, what you can do then is, is you can vary the um, energy scale of your Hamiltonian. You just scale all of your couplings and external fields by some factor. Um, and if you compare it to the physical temperature, then this means that the effective temperature of your system can vary, right? You can control it. Um, th this is, I've just listed um, a few references here, just so you can see that, I mean, this has been done and it, and it works, it, it, it can be done, right? So step number three is out of the way. Um, and now probably, um, since I mentioned it in the beginning, you were wondering where does the machine learning part come in, right? Um, and I've already mentioned that um, sort of because of the complexity, which maybe you can understand a little bit better now because of the, you have to embed a complete graph onto D-Wave. Um, it is, uh, it's hard to solve this model, right? So um, for example, here on the left, you can see um, for a seven by seven system, um, what the true ground state um, is supposed to be like. You can find this out from Monte Carlo simulations or um, just you can even work it out just in your head. Um, so for example, these are these blue uh, spheres here are, these are electrons and they form this triangular lattice pattern, right? As I've shown already before. And then what D-Wave finds when you try to deploy this model, when you do all of the steps I've shown before, is it does indeed find something similar. For example, here in, in this half of the system, it finds the triangular lattice, but it messes up something here, right? So now the question is, can you fix this? And we've came up, we've come up with um, an idea um, which we are working on right now, actually. Um, and the idea is that you use machine learning to fix noise. So how does it work? So you start off with this uh, cubo uh, form of the Hamiltonian um, on D-Wave. And these QIJs, these matrix elements, are essentially your input, which you put onto uh, a D-Wave machine. Um, and then our assumption is, our key assumption, which I think is not that bad, um, is basically when you input these parameters, um, they get messed up, the noise messes them up, right? So for example, you would want um, QIJ zero, 
as your parameter, but something gets added to it, right? Some, some noise which you don't know what it is. And this is the combination of these two is what actually gets sent off to the UA. So the idea is if you could learn about this noise present, if you could somehow subtract it from what you actually send, then you would cancel out this term and get the actual Q0 term that you want, right? So with noise, um, our, our sort of assumption is also that there is random noise present in, uh, uh, on the wave, which is, well, you can't do anything about it. It's random noise. Um, but then on the other hand, we assume that there is some systematic noise, which is really hard to learn about. It's dependent on uh, which Hamiltonian you use, um, like it's which uh, embedding you use. There's a lot of different factors present, but still you can learn about it in principle. And this is where the machine learning part comes in, right? Because it's such a complex problem, you need machine learning. Um, and we're currently de developing um, an active learning approach to learn about this Delta QIJ, um, to then subtract it. And I can say that there are some preliminary results which show that with neural networks, you can actually, there is quite a bit of systematic noise in your system which you can subtract. Like th this is something we are, we have found out um, already. All right, so uh, with that, I'd just like to conclude. Um, so what we have done is we've developed um, a model for um, a real-world uh, experiment um, in, a, in a real-world material, uh, which is the model is perfectly suited to deploy on a D-Wave machine. Um, we have already worked out all the details of how to deploy it. Is it possible to simulate um, our experiment? And it is, um, and we are currently working on actually simulating it. Um, and what this simulation would do is it would actually give us one of the first real world applications of useful quantum computing. And I think that is very important. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um,